Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you today. Thank you for your patience with this uh, delayed broadcast in this particular Sunday. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wrestled with the difference between having belief in something and not believing it? It is a common problem that all of us have faced. I've had it many times in my life. You believe in something or you think something is going to happen a certain way, and then when it doesn't happen, what is the result of that? You start losing your faith in something. You start losing your confidence in something. It's part of the human frailty. It's part of our makeup that we can believe or we can be encouraged in one way and the next minute we're discouraged. We're going to talk about that today. I called this message, Help My Unbelief. And we're going to look at a man in Mark chapter 9, if you have your Bibles. Mark chapter 9 of a man who's wrestling with that very question. On the one hand, he believes, and on the one hand, he doesn't believe. And he is in a serious conflict because it's not only his own belief, it has to do with his son who is very sick. And this man needs to have faith that his son can be healed and that he's going to the right person for the right reason. And so what we're going to talk about is a man who is caught up and the name of the sermon here is Help My Unbelief. We're in Mark chapter 9. Now, we're going to pick up the, the uh, story here right after Jesus had, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, if you remember, in the early part of Mark 9, when he went up into the mountain and he took Peter, James, and John with him. And suddenly he was glowing. There was that light that shined upon him. And of course, Moses and Elijah were there with him. So after that story, here's what happens. We're going to pick it up in verse 14. It says, when they came back down, to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and some scribes were arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens him. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them, and he said, O believing, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Let's just take it right there. So here we have a situation where this man has a son who's sick. He's troubled. He has a spiritual issue. He has a demon in him. He's possessed with a spirit. And here's what happens. He comes to Jesus in verse 17. Says one of the crowd, this is that crowd after he came off the Mount of Transfiguration. Says one of the crowd said to him, teacher, or in other words, master, teacher, master, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. Now here's, here's what happened. The man had actually brought his son to see Jesus, but he didn't find him in the crowd. And so what he does is he does the next best thing. He appeals to Jesus' disciples. And that's what he says in verse 18 after he describes what happens to this man. It says, whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and stiffens out. The man said, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. He told he says he told Jesus' disciples to cast out, and they couldn't do it. The disciples had tried and failed. Now, there is a parallel passage here in Matthew 17. And in Matthew 17, we have some additional dialogue where the disciples come to Jesus, and they want to know why they couldn't do this. Why couldn't they cast the demon out of this young man, this son? And in Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said it was because of the smallness of their faith. So what we're talking about here is faith and belief. There, because of the smallness of even the disciples' faith, they could not perform this miracle that Jesus was about to perform. And so this man who was hoping to see Jesus so that Jesus would heal his son, we can see already that he's starting to, his faith is starting to weaken. Now, Jesus is not going to leave him in that state, of course. So let's go back and we look at this again. It says in verse 17, the man said, Teacher, I brought to you, Jesus, you, my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. 
I told your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do it. Now watch Jesus, watch Jesus' reaction. But before we do that, think about this. Again, we're talking about belief versus unbelief. We're talking to, about someone who is believing and has faith and someone who does not have faith. Faith is the very foundation of our life. Faith is the very foundation of what we're all about. If we don't believe in something, if we don't believe in a higher power, we cannot explain everything around us. Evolutionists will try to explain that to you and so on. But there is a God, and he does exist. And all of us one day are going to face that God. So here we have God here, Jesus. And look at his reaction. His reaction is this, verse 19. He answered them, and he said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I put up with you? How long will I be with you? Bring him to me. He's saying, you're unbelieving. You're, you're blind. You have no faith. Bring this boy to me. Verse 20, they brought the boy to him. When he saw him, when he, the boy, saw him, Jesus, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Notice, this boy did not do this voluntarily. This was done by the spirit that was in him. This was a demon that was in him that was possessing him to make him act like this. This was not just an, a normal uh, medical malady of some kind. This was demon possession because it clearly says here that when he saw him, the demon, when the demon saw Jesus, immediately the spirit threw this boy down into a convulsion on the ground. He's rolling around. He's foaming at the mouth. Now, while this boy is doing that and going into these convulsions, while this spirit has a hold of this boy, we see Jesus in verse 21 ask his father, says verse 21, and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Now, Jesus, being eternal God, already knew what the answer to the question was. Why would Jesus ask questions like that? Why would he inquire things like that? He's establishing a dialogue. He's establishing a rapport with this man. He wants to hear from the man because there's a family connection here. This man loves his son, and he wants to know from the man, how long has this boy been suffering like this? Look what the father says. He said, from childhood, from infancy. Now, from what I can see, or not see, as the case may be, we do not know what age this child was. It just says that he was a son. He was a boy. We don't know if he was five years old, 10 years old. We don't know. The point is that he was infected with this spirit. He was possessed by the spirit, according to his father. It says here, it's been from his childhood, all the way back to his infancy. Now watch what happens. Remember, the scene is now, this boy is on the ground. He's having convulsions. He's foaming at the mouth. He's rolling around. The spirit has him convulsed. Jesus asked the man, how long has this been happening? So in verse 22, the man continues after he says, from childhood, it says, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Now look what he says to Jesus. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Notice the words, if you can do anything. What do you mean if? He says, if you can do anything, it's almost said desperately. It's a last, it's a last ditch effort. It's as if Jesus was his last hope. If you can do anything, your disciples couldn't do it. Chances are other previous doctors that he was with. No one could help his son. And so he says, if you can do something about this, then take pity on us, have compassion on us, feel for us, Lord. The man's faith, look, let's face it, the man's faith at this point was weak to begin with, but it was made even weaker after the disciples failed to cure his son. Imagine you're believing in something so strong and it doesn't happen. Or maybe you go to the disciples because he couldn't find Jesus and they couldn't do it. And your faith is getting weaker and weaker. And now he finally goes to Jesus and he sees Jesus and he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, please have compassion on us. Have, take pity on us. Us. It's a family thing. The father is not sick with the devil. 
the son is. But like any father, he loves his son. He wants his son to be in good health. He wants his son to be healthy again and be rid of this demon possession. And so he's saying, take pity on us and help us. Help us together. So in verse 23, here's what Jesus says. He says, and Jesus said to him. Now he answers this man's statement with a question. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can, question mark, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, we have to be very careful when we, when we read this sentence, because this is one of those verses that has been widely misunderstood. It has been abused. It has been taken out of context. You can't just say exactly what Jesus says. We have to look at things in context and within the context of the Bible. If we just read a statement like this where it says, all things are possible to him who believes. Who believes in what? Who believes in who? What do you mean all things are possible? Are you saying, you know, the most outrageous thing you can think of, it's possible because we believe. What do we believe in? Who do we believe in? Why do we believe in them? And so we can't just take one of the big problems with, with people who are teaching the Bible and people who are preaching it is they have a tendency, some of them, not all, you take a scripture out of context. You just take something like this and you put it up there and you build a whole sermon or a doctrine around that. And suddenly all things are possible for those who believe. Really? Well, first of all, there's a provisor on here. It says to only those who believe. And so we have to be able to determine who he's talking about. What is he talking about? So here we are. Jesus says to him, if you can, Jesus, now remember, in verse 22, the, the man said, if you can do anything. Notice the word if. So what happens? Jesus comes back at him in verse 23, and he says, if you can. The man threw out the word if at Jesus and in, a, in a moment of doubt. If you can do anything, if. So, the, so Jesus comes right back at him and says, if. You're saying if do you are, it's like he's saying, do you have any idea who you're speaking with? Jesus put an if right back at the man. It's if he's saying, the man is saying, Jesus, if you are able to do something, and Jesus is ex essentially asking the man if he can believe that Jesus can heal his son. And Jesus repeats those same three words back in him. If you can, sir, if you can believe. If you can, then all things are possible for those who believe. All things. But all things can be accomplished only by God, not by us. Look at this again. Jesus says to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, Jesus is talking in the context of healing this young boy. We can't take things in the Bible out of context because then it starts saying things that God never intended it to say. We have to look at it within the context of the passage of what Jesus is saying. He's telling the man to believe. He's telling the man that all things are possible if he will just believe. Jesus already knows his faith is weak because we're going to see that in the next verse when he has this conflict between believing and not believing. And so Jesus very carefully says, all things are possible to him who believes. See, the things that for him that believe, it's in the power and in the goodness of God. God is not going to do anything in our favor without faith. All things, and listen, all things are not possible to be done by a believer by himself or by herself. But all things are possible to be done for him by God, by Christ. By the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? We, all things are not possible through our own efforts. We of ourselves can do nothing. I can't heal someone. You can heal someone. Not in the miraculous way that Jesus did. All things are not possible for them who believe. It has to come through the power of God. The disciples couldn't do it. Whatever this man, if he took him to doctors, this man couldn't even lay hands on his own child and heal him. Jesus is going to heal him as we look through this passage, okay? And so this man is, he is coming to Jesus and he's saying, if you can do this. And then Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for them who believe. So if you are a believer, 
you still have to believe in something. You can't believe in nothing and expect all things to be possible. Jesus is very specific in what he's saying. All things are possible to him who believes. Believes in what? Believes in Jesus. Believes that he is the Son of God. Believes that he is the Messiah. Believes that he is the Savior. Believe that he is eternal God himself. That all things are possible. All things are possible then. So, let's move on. Verse 24. Immediately, right away, straight away, no hesitation. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, here's the key. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Right there is your conflict. On the one hand, he's saying, I do believe. And yes, I believe all things are possible for those who believe. But help my unbelief. How often do we have that in our life? How often has that occurred to you? We believe in something, and if something doesn't work out the way we want, our belief or our faith goes right out the window. We can say on one hand, I believe, and on the other hand, but I don't believe. We can have faith in someone, but as soon as we, they break our trust or they do something we don't like, suddenly we don't believe in them anymore. We can put our faith in something, and if it doesn't work out, we lose our faith. Aren't we fickle that way? Human beings are fickle. That's the way we are. We believe and we don't believe. We believe and we don't believe. Do you think this man would have come looking for Jesus to heal his son if he had not had some kind of belief in him to begin with? But because of the trek, because of where he went, because he couldn't find Jesus right away, and he settled for the next best thing, which was Jesus' disciples, and they could not heal him, you could imagine the faith that he had was starting to crumble. It was starting to weaken. It was starting to go down. And by the time he finally found Jesus, he's saying in an almost in a desperation, exasperated mode, Lord, if, if you can do anything, please have pity on us. Please have compassion on us. You see what's happening to my son. And Jesus is saying, all things are possible for him who believes. He's trying to build the man's faith up is what he's doing. He's telling the man, you believe, believe in me, and you will see great things. You will see greater things. And so the man says, I do believe, help my unbelief. The conflict between faith and unfaith between believing and not believing this is what we have to face today we have to believe in something you can choose not to believe in something but even not believing in something is believing in something think about it even if you don't believe you are still believing to some degree but jesus is saying all things are possible for them who believe in him in him because we're about to see the miracle happen where this young man, this boy, is healed through the power of God. So all things are possible in the power of God. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, to whoever he wants, if he wants. God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He created this universe by speaking it into existence. Jesus himself, being eternal God, is able to heal through the power that his Father gave him on earth. So look at this. The man says, I do believe. How can we look at that? I have faith. I have confidence in Christ. I do believe. But it's not enough. It's not enough because then he says, almost in a way, he says, help my unbelief. In other words, Lord, give me strength to have complete or entire confidence of you. I believe you, but there's doubt. And we all need to keep this prayer really on our lips. We often doubt and lack faith, don't we? I mean, come on, let's face it. We often will say, yes, I believe God's going to do this. And if he doesn't do it the way we hope or the way we prayed for, we start doubting, don't we? Satan is a great deceiver at doubting, putting doubt in our minds. He did it to Eve. And he's done it to countless millions of people since then. He'll start putting doubt in your mind. Did God really say this? Are you really going to do that? And we may get an answer to a prayer from God if it's not exactly in our timing, if it's not exactly the way we want, if we've been praying for something and it hasn't happened, what does Satan do? He starts putting doubt in our mind. He starts attacking our faith. He starts attacking our belief. 
And that's where unbelief comes from. It's not that this man didn't believe in Jesus at all. Not at all. Not at all. He had faith. And so let's look at this. It says here, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. He was, he was exercising demon possession. It says, after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, he came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive this out? And Jesus said, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. You see, it was not a medical condition that any of us knew about, whether it was epilepsy or anything else. This young man, this boy was demon possessed. And Jesus had to command this spirit to come out of him. They're the kind of things that are possible to those who believe in Jesus. It's not that I can do it. I can't drive anything out, and neither can you. We don't have that gift. We don't have that sense of uh, miraculous healing that Jesus was given because Jesus, being eternal God, created you. He created me. He can replace anything on us. He can change anything he wants about us. He can heal us at any time. But it, these things are possible for those who believe in Jesus Christ. If I put that kind of faith in another man or a faith healer or a priest or a pastor, these things are not going to happen unless I have that kind of faith that is not wavering. And I have the faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I have my faith is grounded in my Lord and Savior. That's what he's talking about. That's the difference between faith and not having faith. It's the difference between belief and not having belief. This man said, Jesus, I do believe but help my unbelief. Jesus is teaching all of us in this passage here that we have to believe in him, not in someone else, not even the disciples. Don't even believe in them as far as these types of miracles, these types of healings going. Only Jesus can do this. Help my unbelief can be accomplished in two ways. Number one, removing unbelief removing this man's unbelief, and number two, by healing his son and restoring his faith. So when the man said, I do believe, wonderful statement, I do believe, but there was something behind that. He wasn't totally convinced because then he went and said, help my unbelief. So what did Jesus do? He helped his unbelief. He helped them by removing the man's unbelief and by healing his son so that when we get to the end of this passage, this son, everybody thought he was dead and Jesus picked him, raised him up and he got up and he was fine. No more demon possession. Did he help the man's faith? Did he help the man's unbelief? Yes, he did. Well, let me ask you this. How many times in your life have you had this type of situation? I'm not talking about necessarily a miracle that we're seeing here, a physical miracle. But how many times have you proclaimed faith in God and something's happened and you say one minute, yes, God, I believe you. But the next minute, you don't believe God. Let's just say, for instance, that God sends you on a path, a certain business route, or he, he, the Holy Spirit encourages you to move somewhere. And you move thinking it's a whole new life and everything's going to be wonderful. But once you get there, life is harder than you can ever imagine. There's difficulty. There's challenge after challenge. What does that do to your faith? We see people in the Bible that have great faith. Abraham had wonderful faith. When he told, when God told Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land that I will show you in Genesis 12, Abraham packed his family up and he left and he went. He went blindly. He went because God told him to go. Abraham's faith was strong. But then there could be someone else that they say, God, I, I don't know where you're taking me. And until you show me exactly where I'm going, I'm not going. That's the difference between having belief or faith in God and having unbelief or doubt in God. There's a big difference. And this man was conflicted. How many times have you been conflicted? Maybe today, right now, this very moment, you are conflicted. You believe, but you don't believe. You believe, but you're having doubts. 
You say you believe, but maybe deep down in your heart or soul, you're not sure. There is a way to know that you're absolutely, that you can believe without unbelief. Now, because we are humans, and even though we are saved, those of us who are true believers, we are saved in our soul existence. We still have a body that lusts after sin. We still have minds that go haywire every now and then because we're not in our glorified body yet. We, are, we have a resurrected soul only. We have eternal life. We have that gift. If Jesus is our Lord and Savior, he's paid for our sins. We have that already. But in the meantime, this world, the people in it, the situations in it, the situations we put ourselves in can wreak all kinds of havoc with us where we suddenly don't have the faith we need to have. Is that your situation today? Are you saying on one hand, yes, I believe, but on the other hand, Lord, help my unbelief. Can our prayer be today that if you are struggling in any part of your faith or your belief, that you confess that to God? He's listening. He's hearing right now. And he will help your unbelief. Maybe not in the miraculous way that Jesus did with this young boy by driving a demon out of him. But that's not always the way God has to work. Sometimes it's just removing doubt from your mind. Sometimes it's just removing doubt where you say, God, I believe you said this, and I'm going to stake my life on it. I'm going to believe it. There, there, there's, a, there's a mantra that goes around. It says this, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Have you heard that before? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That is faith. That is faith right there. But all of us have those moments where our faith is wavering. All of us have those moments where we just have to confess to God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Help me to trust in you more, God. Help me to rely on you more, God. Help me to depend on you more, God. Help me to confess more to you, God. Let Build my faith up. Build my belief up so that I don't have these times where I have to say, help my unbelief. We have an example here. This man was conflicted. Jesus solved that problem for him by not only healing his son, by lifting up and removing his unbelief. He wanted to see Jesus. He said at the beginning of the passage, I brought him to you. And Jesus healed him and restored the man's faith all at the same time. I pray that this message has been some blessing to you. If it has, please feel free to share it. Uh, God has said in Isaiah 55 that his word will not return void. It reaches those who he intended to reach. It reached someone today. Someone needed to hear this message because that's God's word and it's going out and it's reaching whoever God wants it to reach. So if it's reached you, if it's convicted you, maybe if it's given you something to think about, maybe if you don't even agree with me, that's okay. That's okay. All I ask you to do is to consider it. Look at the Bible yourself. Read it. Let God convict you of that. Let him build your faith. Our church family, you know I say this all the time. Be a Berean. Acts 1711 says this, that the Bereans were more noble than other people. They weren't better. They weren't smarter. They were more noble. You know why? Because the Bible says that they searched the scriptures every single day to make sure that what they were hearing is the truth. I encourage you. I ask you to do that, not just with this message or anything that I'm preaching or teaching, but with anyone, anyone you hear on radio, television, internet, any church you're going to, anywhere that you hear the word of God preached or taught, you owe it to yourself to go to the book, go to God's word, and see if what you are hearing is true. Because there is some bad teaching out there, there's some bad theology out there, there are some things that, that people just have wrong. So you owe it to yourself. Be a Berean. Check the word of God out. It's not going to hurt you. You may even learn something from it. You may even come to truth. Your faith may even be built up. And so you wouldn't have an opportunity or another situation where you say, help my unbelief, because your belief and your faith will be strong. Be a Berean. Be a Berean.